instructor at the college, and we have a student. Uh, Thanks, Bob. Oh, uh, yeah. And also extra credit after that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is the first time I've done this, so Bob reminded me there are bathrooms back there for those of you. Uh, Great. Thank you. Well, I'm Randy, Randy Grissom, as Bob said. I'm the director of the Sustainable Technology Center uh, at the college. Uh, we have a lot of programs besides <clears throat> biofuels program. Uh, we've got a solar program, a water conservation program, and we've got a green building uh, construction program, <clears throat> which are all programs within the Sustainable Technology Center. So tonight what we're going to do is talk to you a little bit about biofuels, talk to you about our training program, about how biofuels work. Uh, Xander and James are going to demonstrate some things for you, and We'll be glad to answer whatever questions we can as we go by. Uh, the first question is, why do we want or care about having biofuels? Okay. Um, anybody, anybody got a, an answer to that? Why biofuels? And the people from the college can't answer this. Yeah. Okay. And why do we need an alternative energy source? Running out of fossil fuels. Cheap oil is over as we know it for the most part. 20% uh, of the oil that we have, it comes from 14 large oil fields. The largest one's in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it produces about 5% of the world's oil in 2004, and it's on a decline. So oil as we know it pretty much peaked uh, in the early 1990s. But we're still growing and we're still using more and more fuel every day. So if we want to keep up our lifestyle, we need to find some alternative sources of fuels. Just to give you a little bit different picture, in the 1960s, we were discovering about 55 billion barrels of oil per year. In the 1980s, that dropped to somewhere between 19 and 40 billion barrels a year. And in the 2000s, this first decade of the 21st century, about 7 billion barrels per year. Uh, we consume about 31 billion barrels per, per year. And so, as you can see, we're going to have a problem here one of these days soon if we don't figure out something to do. From an oil cons uh, consumption standpoint, worldwide we use about 89, 85 million barrels a day. 20 million of that is used by the U.S. And uh, we only produce about 5 million barrels a day uh, in the U.S. And you can see what the other countries uh, do right there. Um, according to the International Energy Association, uh, our rate of, uh, of use of oil and the discovery of oil we're on a path that's not sustainable, and basically cheap oil as we know it has come to an end. So it's going to cost us more, but we're also going to run out. There's a lot of, a lot of different projects going on around the world in, to come up with more petroleum products. Uh, one of them is, is to taking coal to liquids. Uh, this is a fissure trope reactor uh, that's being built, and uh, you can convert coal into a liquid petroleum. Uh, U.S. and China have the largest uh, coal reserves in the world, uh, but these are big multi-billion dollar projects and they're not so environmentally friendly. Another way is uh, getting uh, oil out of the Canadian tar sands. Um, this is a picture uh, of what it looks like where they've done it. Uh, the tailings pond, you get a lot of waste from trying to get oil out of the tar sands in Canada. So it's becoming a real environmental problem. Uh, you, to get the, the oil out of the tar sands, uh, it takes two tons, two tons of tar sand to produce one barrel of oil. That's 42 gallons. So two tons of sand produce 42 gallons of oil. And each barrel produces about three times the amount of greenhouse gases that are emitted by conventional oil. So it's certainly not a, an environmentally friendly method of getting more fuel. Okay? And one barrel of oil produces two barrels of toxic waste. Okay? So unless we can come up with some different technologies, this is not a very good one for us to look at. So basically the warning is that our, our large reserves are, are running out and we just got to find out something to do with it. So biofuels has got to be part of the solution. Okay? But you can make biofuels from a variety of different feedstocks. Uh, traditionally in this country we've made biofuels from corn and soy. Well, there's been a lot of concern about using corn and soy because that's products that we eat as food for ourselves or is used as feed for cattle that we also eat. So, you know, we don't want to compete with our own food sources. Uh, sugar cane is used in a lot, many parts of the world, Brazil uh, and in Hawaii, where I actually lived for a while. 
Camelina, Buffalo Gourd, Switchgrass are all other products that can be used, some of which, like Buffalo Gourd, is a weed here in New Mexico. But the up and coming ones that we're excited about are algae, which we're going to talk a little bit about, and the use of waste materials, which we're actually going to demonstrate some uh, in here today. <clears throat> to meet some of these needs of producing biofuels, uh, Santa Fe Community College put together a program last year uh, that we're just completing our second semester. It's a two semester certificate program. And we got some funding through a, a group called Wired here in New Mexico. And uh, it's been a very successful program. Xander's here, he's one of our students. We've got a couple other students I saw around the office, around the office, around the audience. Um, it's a two semester program where you take 15 credit hours one semester and 14 the next. And you take Introduction to Sustainable Energy Technologies. You take two science courses, a biology course in a lab and a chemistry course in a lab. Uh, we take an electrical and mechanical fundamentals class because you got to know how the pumps and everything work and Xander's going to talk to you that. And then there's three specific courses in the alternative fuels program. The first one is our alternative fuels 111 class which is the introduction to alternative fuels and vehicle technologies. So you learn all about how the engines work, how, how you make fuels in general. It's more of the academic class. And then you go into the Biofuels 1 and the Biofuels 2 classes. And those are the lab classes where you learn to make biodiesel, uh, we grow algae, we learn how to extract oil from algae, uh, and so forth. Okay. Our uh, intention of this program is to provide students with the critical knowledge and skills they need to develop and successfully participate in this industry. Many of our students are going to be plant technicians or managers, lab technicians. They may be involved in sales, but many of them are going to be business owners. There's going to be a lot of opportunity to start and operate small businesses that have some role in the whole biofuels uh, industry. So we'll, we'll give you a few more examples of that as we go along. Uh, this is the, the Santa Fe Community College campus. Not on here is we got a big building going in right in this whole area, which is our Sustainable Technology Center. And it'll be finished in November, and we'll be having our classes in there starting next spring. So those of you who will be going to college in the next couple of years will have a, a brand new state-of-the-art sustainability center uh, to go and learn classes. Uh, at the college, we're out in the county, so we have our own wastewater treatment facility. So we have this large pond, which is uh, the source of our wastewater. And we're going to be able to use that water to grow algae uh, for this program. And we have a lot of land around the college to uh, do some things in. Um, so the core focus of the program is just to focus, learn about different types of fuels, how they're made, uh, how to make them safely. And in the students, the lab, uh, in the lab, the students learn how to do that. So I'm going to let James and, and, and Xander come up, and we're going to talk a little bit more about some of these, and then we'll get back to some slides here in a little bit. Okay. Bingham, this is my partner in biofuels world, Xander. He's my building guy. He's a whole lot of fun. I got to put up a quote here real quick. After you heard all about the disparaging news about we're running out of fuel. Homeland security begins with homemade fuel. I consider myself in the oil business, but I don't have to go below grade to go find my oil supply source. What we have, this is basic everyday out the back door vegetable cooking oil. You all go out for dinner, you'll have a favorite place to eat. La Fonda, McDonald's, any of those other places. This is cooking oil, just plain old everyday cooking oil. We can convert this day right in the engine under DC vehicle. We're also working on, other research labs are working on being able to convert this to run in a gasoline engine. So there is a difference at this point. When we talk about biofuels, in this class, it's biodiesel, specifically for, for diesel trucks, school buses, the big trucks like that. First step in the process, you see the dark, sludgy stuff on the bottom? 
That's what we're separating out. We have to go through a molecular and chemical process to separate out the stuff that won't burn in the diesel engine. This is called glycerin. This is finished fuel. It's nice and sparkly and clean. And the other cool thing about this is that when you get done with it, you need it too. This is all biodegradable. If you spill this on the ground, the EPA will not be mad at you. If you spill this stuff on the ground, this is petroleum diesel. If y'all want to take a whiff, you probably all, this is just nasty, stinky stuff. I don't want to drink this. This will put me in the ground. But if you spill this, the feds are unhappy with you. This is biodegradable. This will break down into common components and disappear into the ground. This is the, that's the cool stuff. The fun thing is, is that this oil is the ultimate, I consider, the ultimate in recycling because it's already done one tour of duty in a restaurant. You know, the restaurant buys it and they cook with it, deep fat fry, french fries, tortillas, shrimp, tempura, that kind of stuff. But when they're done with it, they set it out back. The majority of the restaurants in town have a contract with somebody in town. We're working on getting more of it to have somebody haul the stuff away. Sometimes they take it to the dump, which isn't all that great, or they send it down to well, places like Purina, cat food, and puppy chow. This gets turned into dog food, a reasonably good recycling source, but we have more fun with this because we can put this in our car when we get done with it. The other really fun thing about this aspect of biodiesel, because it's so easily integrates with the system that's already out there, the petroleum world, so we can take a little bit of this, a little bit of this, find my official stir stick. <laughs> Pliers. Multi-purpose tool. The sweet thing is now, this is completely compatible with the petroleum diesel. So, and, and the reason, the, what makes this unique and, and really important at this point, especially in Santa Fe at this elevation, this biodiesel will start to gel at a higher temperature than the petroleum stuff will. So if it gets cold enough, this stuff will start actually to haze and the wax crystals will reappear in this and it will not flow through the system of the engine. In the summertime when it's 90 degrees out, that's not a problem. You can, we can run this straight. We can mix this, which is, so in the wintertime when it's cold, if we put a little bit of petroleum diesel in here, we can get down into the 12 degree range, the zero degree range, car will still start, truck will still start. This is no longer edible because we put this nasty stuff in there. But the cool thing is, is you can take, you can mix this. We can we can make this in mass, and we can put this into the infrastructure that's already out there in bio in diesel tanks that are already at gas stations. We don't have to develop a whole new system um, like hydrogen. Hydrogen is a really cool gas. It floats, blends really really well. But to integrate it into the system. For consumer use, there's no filling stations. This stuff goes straight into the local filling stations, which is really pretty cool. Um, and I've run on long enough. Right now. We make it in the lab for about 75 cents a gallon for our, our own personal use. When we go to the commercial level, we will try to hit a competitive number so that we're within a few cents up or lower of petroleum diesel. Because when we go commercial, we have to pay a road tax, and we have to pay a, um, testing fees, and we have to keep the EPA ha happy. That's where the majority of our costs come in. We can put this in our own personal vehicles for just the, the straight cost. So that's, that's where the jump is that um, we sh we're still working on being competitive with petroleum and diesel. Um, our good friend Charles Bensinger is in the back corner. He's a, He's the, uh, the other instructor, but he is also the man responsible for the B20 pumps and the E85 and the E10 pumps at the Baca Street Station. If you need to drive diesel trucks and you're looking for fuel, you can get B20 there. And we owe a round of applause to Charles for having put that stuff in. It's the first one in the state or in the country? It's first one in the state. First one in the state, at least. Yeah. That first station. Triple biofuels in the country. In the country. It's even bigger than, than I thought. So, you know, it is out there, this fuel is available in a B20 level. Hopefully we're going to be able to expand the whole program. We'll get some of you folks interested in how this works. And we'll be able to have B20, B40, B50 pumps all over the place. Explain to them what B20, 40, 50 means. Okay, good, good point. 
go back over to my graphics board over here. Everybody got this in your notes? I can erase this. I, I get used to the nomenclature, so I forget that not everybody's up to speed on this whole thing. Okay, Charles Station down on Baca Street sells um, a biodiesel that's called B20. They also sell regular petroleum diesel. This is a blend, 20% biodiesel and 80% of that other stuff that's readily available at the commercial pumps. So when we run these numbers, this is, you know, that's short for biodiesel. And this is our ratio amount. So we can talk about, oh, well, it's warming up now in the summertime. I can run B60 equates to a 60% biodiesel over a 40% petroleum. This is a quick way of knowing what the <coughs> ratio is. And then when it gets really warm and you get your truck cleaned up enough to where it really runs it, you can run B100 straight biodiesel. So that's... That's the, uh, some of that nomenclature. The, um, let's see, it's your turn. All right. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm, I'm at Xander PGC, and I'm a student at the uh, college. I'm in Biofuels 2 now. Um, so, I've been in for almost, no, I've been in almost two semesters now. Um, this is something I've built during the first semester. This is a small processor, so pretty much what you do is you stick the oil in uh, um, here, you suck it into the machine, and you're gonna add, pretty much how you make biodiesel is you use alcohol and a catalyst. Um, the alcohol can be methanol, um, ethanol, uh, I think you can even use isopropanol. Yeah, we've um, tried a few times. But, but you have to use different ratios for the different alcohols. Um, we use KOH because it's not like harmful, it's not as harmful as the other stuff that you might use, um, it's potassium hydroxide. Um, so pretty much you put everything in here, you let it go around a couple of times, and um, you let it sit for about 24 hours. And then um, I had it set up so that um, once it was done, you pump it out and it goes into here, and you get the separation here, the glycerin and the biodiesel, and then you can put it into your tank if you have a diesel vehicle, and it works. Um, some other cool things about biodiesel, it actually cleans your engine and it lubricates it so that um, your engine lasts longer, it's, it, it works better. Um, and instead of having that diesel smell, you have more of like a, like a french fry smell. <laughs> or even a burrito smell, it's whatever, whatever the food that was cooked in it is what it usually smells like. Um, I get my, my oil from my dad's restaurant, he owns an Italian restaurant, it smells like uh, um, calamari. Um, and burn that. So it's a lot. It's a lot more pleasant than the uh, petrol fuels. Um, in the class, we also do um, work with ethanol. Um, we also explore hydrogen um, and also natural gas. We've we've done some work in natural gas as well. Um, and it's, I think it's really cool that you can like drink the fuel and like it's <laughs> not like I don't drink it, but like, like, it's kind of cool instead of this like really toxic stuff. We have this, this fuel that's like can be price competitive and is a lot better um, in general. Um, so I like, and if you have a diesel car, you can start filling it up with the B20 or, or whatever. And the, the reason that you want to kind of work your way up is because it cleans the engine. And you, if, you, if you do it too fast, you actually get all this crud that comes out and, and blocks it from the, the fuels that you're using before. So it is a really good choice to start to switch if you can. Tell them about the, you mentioned you get the biodiesel and then you get glycerin. Tell them about glycerin. Yeah, so glycerin, uh, glycerin is a byproduct of the whole pro of the process. So I don't know, maybe some of you nitroglycerin, uh, that's dynamite. So you can use it, technically you could use it to make dynamite if you want, but more, more likely it's you're going to turn into soap, uh, which is another way you can make money to cover the costs of your operation. Um, and it's pretty easy to clean up. Uh, I have a disc on it, I've never done it, but it seems like it's a pretty easy process and you can use the glycerin as well to clean engines. It pulls grease off the stuff really fast and uh, it's, it's kind of cool. Um, what else? Right. Here's the 
the bottom layer of this jar is the glycerin that we can turn into a soap. And for all the guys in the class who have ever tinkered with an engine, you know how dirty your hands can get in no time? This is a great solvent. I use it all the time. I just pour back batches of it and it just cuts automotive grease really, really well. So the cool thing, another cool part about it is that our byproduct from our processing, our chemical processor, is another usable product. We can clean it up a little bit, filtrate it, and we can use it as a soap. So we've, got, we've taken a waste product, created a usable fuel product from it. Our waste product, which we won't call a waste product, it's a byproduct, is a soap. We're actually going to try and filter it and clean it up and get approval from the school to put it in the dispensers at, in the school lavatories. Okay. Xander, is that still mostly just a hot water? Um, your own. Um, and like you kind of have to figure like some stuff out yourself, but it's really, it's really simple and like the main costs for the whole process are the KOH and the methanol. Um, but if you have the machine, you can, I believe, BioLyle, which is this DVD that we were watching where this guy did it. Um, he's, he was producing biodiesel for, I think, 86 cents a gallon. Yeah, he's got it down yeah. really well. He's been yeah. at it for a number of years. So you not only, so you spend 80 cents per gallon, and you can save yourself like a heck of a lot of money and learn something in the process. Um, yes? Can you written patents on this uh, operation? Well, I don't know. I, not, no, I haven't. Cause <laughs> I, I was going to write a patent on something, and I went on there, they wanted to charge me an arm and a leg. Uh, <laughs> but that would be the way to get it into the no, yeah. a uh, real production company. Well, no, I, I agree. Um, the thing is, is that um, I didn't come up with this, um, and I think it's really I think educating like kids on how to do it and making them because if, if, they, if they if they if they have a diesel vehicle like one of my friends has a diesel truck like I can supply him with the fuel and like not only do I make money but instead of like him buying it from like because mostly oil is coming from across seas it comes from in America and it becomes more independent and it's kind of hard to fight the oil industry right now at this time and they they have a ton of money and they can shut you down in a second because like a uh, myth they put out is that ethanol can't be put in a normal car engine and it can. I run my car on ethanol um, and it's just a normal Honda Civic and they say oh it corrodes this, it corrodes that and it, all it does is it cleans my engine um, <laughs> and it makes me go faster because the fuel actually has oxygen in it so my engine goes a heck of a lot faster as well. Um, what percentage ethanol? Um, I have 80% because you can't buy 100% because that's like alcohol and then you have people drinking it. Um, so um, they, they only sell, they have 80% at some of the pumps here and I, I've been filling it up for like a year now and my car works great. So um, I think. What? Yeah, my guy, it's a normal guy sitting out there. It looks kind of beat up, but. So, yeah, it's, not, it's not a diesel, it's a regular car. It's right. a regular car, it's not a diesel. Um, regular cars use ethanol, and then um, the diesel cars, they use biodiesel. Um, it's pretty much like they're, they're alternate, they're kind of parts. Yeah. Yes? Do you know when you're talking about that, how old like, might there be a cutoff for a car that wouldn't have been able to do that? Like, I have a 1990, which is. Old. Um, <laughs> I think the older, it, well, no, the newer is the better. If it has a computer in it, what the computer does is it changes the air ratio because the alcohol fuel has a lot more oxygen in it. Um, so when you like accelerate, you're really going to feel yourself like, whoa. And uh, what, what the new cars do is they make it and make a small adjustment so that um, it works more efficiently. Um, I wouldn't recommend putting ethanol fuel in your car. Um, but there are, there are like little computer chips you can buy, um, like White Lightning is one of the brands um, that you just, it's very simple. You go on whitelightning.com, you order it, you plug it in, and your car will be completely adjusted for ethanol. And like you won't get the extra acceleration that you did before, um, but you'll get really good gas mileage. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see that, that these fuels are out there, but people have kind of like, talk trash at them, and <laughs> now people are scared to use them when they're perfectly good, so. Yeah, just to add to that, I, I just moved back, well not just, a little over a year ago, uh, to Santa Fe from Hawaii, and in Hawaii I was working for a pineapple growing operation, 
And we had those big trucks and plows that worked up in the fields uh, to, to turn the dirt to plant the pineapples. And many of them dated from the 1960s. And we were able to run them on, on B20 and B40. They lost a little bit of their power in trying to go uphill in, those, in the heavy mud. Uh, but we were trying to convert uh, everything to much more environmentally friendly um, fuel over there. Okay. That's my next slide. So. Well, this one's very small. I have, I have, I have a 55 gallon at my house, and it takes, uh, I could do maybe, I haven't had it back to back, like operational, and I've done like maybe like one, and then like, it's like maybe a month later do another batch, but it takes about, um, if you have a container, do the washing separately. Um, the wash is just an extra process to get it clean. Um, it probably take like a week, uh, maybe like two weeks. Uh, well, like a week and a, the wash is only like three days, right? Yeah. yeah so like four days. Inside of a week. Yeah, inside of a week. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if you have two, if you have processors, if you have five processors, you can time them. So when one finish, one starts, and you have 55 gallons a day. Then, um, so there's a way to do it to make it very like back to back to back. To get you got another experiment, you? Do you? you want to explain to me how that works first? Oil. Um, Let's see, I think you get, you get, um, Taffer, now I, I have it in my notes, um, but, uh, At 90%. You know, what's, the, what's the percentage of, uh, biodiesel, um, biodiesel from, like, from the oil? Like, what percentage? Of oh, the, um, what your, your produced amount is to the glycerin? It's about 85%. Yeah, 85 percent. <coughs> to me. My turn? Yep. Okay, we've got a slide up here of the, uh, Biodiesel lab at the, uh, this is an off-campus site, but we'll just pretend it's at the school for now. Um, if any of you have ever worked in a restaurant, you're familiar with all this collection of stuff. This is what, the, what, what well, that, that's what the new oil comes in. It's also what the old oil goes out with. This is our main supply line of picking up oil from the restaurants. And, uh, this is a preheat tank. We put this oil into here, and it's basically it's open top hot water heater. It's just got a, a heating element inside of it. We heat this up to about 130 <coughs> degrees. We pipe it into this thing. It looks like it came from Roswell. <laughs> and this little brother that came from Roswell, now as Xander had mentioned, our meth oxide mix goes into the little tank over there. We mix the methanol and the powdered flakes of KOH, which is potassium hydroxide. Those are the two caustic, nasty parts of the program. Uh, other than that, it's a pretty benign system. We'll mix in a little tank, we'll add the meth oxide into the big tank, and we'll let that run for a couple of hours. It just, it just self-circulates. <coughs> pumping system down below, you can see some of, the, some of the plumbing in there. We'll let that run for a couple of hours, we'll come back in, we'll shut it off, and we'll let it sit for an hour. And what happens within that hour is this. The glycerin will drop out within an hour. It comes out really, really quick. We then drain it off the bottom. That's why these tanks are, are cone bottom tanks, is we can drain off the stuff that we don't want from down below. Instead of trying to get the stuff we want from on top, it's just easier when you work with gravity. We'll take the glycerin out, we'll set it off to the side for the soap making department. The, finish, the raw biodiesel will then go into one of these two other 55 gallon drums, which we will run through a mist washer. You have to wash the fuel to get the rest of the soap and the other impurities the remaining methanol and the KOH back out of it. Once it's had a chance, it basically just takes a shower and it gets clean. The water, as you know, if you've ever mixed salad dressing, oil and water don't mix. You get oil on the top and water down below. The water will migrate to the bottom of the drum. It will take with it all the soap and the junk. It looks like white paint. It's that, it's that thick of stuff. That takes all the junk out of the fuel. So we'll then take the fuel off the top, run it through that tall yellow cylinder on the end here, and that's full of something called Thermax T45. It's a resin bead that at a molecular level has a bazillion little holes in it, and it's highly, highly absorbent. We run the raw biodiesel through the yellow tube, and the reason that it's so tall, it's like a big vertical coffee percolator. It has to soak down through all of that vertical space that's full of the resins, and that takes out the rest of the impurities. It just makes a nice, fine, finished fuel product. And then from there, it goes all the way over here into the corner. You can see this one drum with the little red button on the top. 
That's the finished biodiesel station. Yes, ma'am. Is the glycerin an inherent compound of the cooking oil? It is. It's yes, not it is. something that comes from what's being cooked in. No. Okay. Yeah, and at the molecular level, vegetable oil is a glycerin cell, a glycerin molecule, and three fatty acid chains. And we, we can get into the chemistry of it later on. And the people that try to run, and the people that run straight vegetable oil, you can run raw vegetable oil in a diesel engine. Problem is, the system that they use doesn't remove this stuff. This stuff will make a mess out of an engine. So that's, I'm not a proponent of running straight vegetable oil. So the chemical process, to answer your question, separates that out. It breaks off that glycerin chain and gets it out of our way so that we have a, basically it's a hydrocarbon molecular system similar to fuel, to gasoline and diesel, without the crud. Any other questions while we're in class? There may be a couple of those slides here, it's just some pictures. Okay, here we are, students in class. Um, with the classroom, we make small batches. These are miniature versions of the thing that looks like it came from Roswell. And the students can team up and they can use these. These are basically just jars that are inverted with a valve on the bottom. So it's a miniature version of this. And we'll put our, they're making fuel here. They're washing fuel. And you can put it in these smaller versions so that when you make it on a, at a liter level, if you make a mistake, it's no big deal. If you make a mistake at the 40 gallon level, it's a bigger mess to clean up. So they get a better hands-on chance of seeing how the process works at a much smaller scale. We can drain off the glycerin into these small jugs down below. So it's, it's a total um, miniature version of what goes on in the big, the big processors. This, even though it looks like just total pandemonium and chaos, we have um, Raw oil here, we have biodiesel here that has been washed and it turns into what we call orange juice after you wash it a few times, it'll turn this orangey color as the water is pulling out the soaps and the glycerins. We have washed water here, a number of things, um, titration. titration kits, you know, so it's, it's a very active lab, it's a very hands-on kind of thing, this isn't an academic thing. We get, if you try to read this process in a book, it'll either put you to sleep or scare you to death. It's just, but when you come into the lab and you go, hey, this isn't, you know, I've got a fine arts degree and I'm teaching biodiesel, so it can't be that difficult. <laughs> um, yeah, so each student gets a bottle, and they, they work at that smaller level, and they have the hands-on experience of seeing how this stuff actually works, because sometimes in the big processor, you can't see all of the cool things that go on. And you're all, you're all welcome to come out talk to Randy about getting a map to the school that's over in our Shara village. Come by and take a look because this up on the wall is, is, these are cool pictures and whatnot, but to actually walk in there and see this whole thing in operation is really pretty eye-opening to realize that we can do what Phillips Petroleum is doing at a much cleaner and a much more local level. Yes, ma'am. How much water do you have to use to wash it? It's about a one-to-one -one ratio, gallon per gallon. And that's one of the things that we are working on is to figure out other technologies that will Reduce our amount of water, that's what this resin tank does. It takes a lot of the stuff out of the fuel that water would. And of course, water up here in the desert is a very valuable resource, so we're trying to minimize those uses. There's a company up in Canada that I am in contact with. They use wood chips. They put a similar concept like this. They put wood chips in a big old 55-gallon drum they poke a hole in the bottom of the drum and they let the fuel percolate down through the wood chips. We're experimenting with that in the classroom also. So if there's a chance we'll be able to use wood chips, a minimal amount of water, and this guy to get us to clean fuel. Yes, sir. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so you have to start with cooking oil. And if you just, you know, um, estimated how much cooking oil is available to you here in Santa Fe. Mm -hmm. um, how much gasoline, effectively, fuel can you produce? That's one question. And secondly, somebody has to grow the crops to make the oil from which you derive this. And all of that requires energy and so on. So if you take, do all the energy accounting, mm -hmm. you know, how, how, does, how does this do? It comes out rather well. I don't have the specific numbers for how many thousands of gallons are in Santa Fe. 
But y'all know this town's just ripe with restaurants everywhere you go, every street. What we are doing with the uh, advanced class is one of the assignments is to go to talk to Noble Cisco, the main food supplier for the restaurants in town. If any of you are restaurant tours, you know what I'm talking about. You've probably seen their trucks running around town. Well, they're the ones that bring the cooking oil to the restaurants. Well, Don on me the other day says, why not talk to Noble Cisco and say, how much oil do you guys sell per month to all the restaurants in Santa Fe? They should be able to punch that up on a spreadsheet and they say, okay, we sell you know, 30,000 gallons or some number, I have no idea what it is. A lot of people say you can't get enough oil from restaurants to really do anything. I've got 1,200 gallons of waste vegetable oil in my garage at home that's waiting to be processed. We've got another 500 at the lab, and we've got students out there talking to <coughs> the restaurant tours out there. I think we've got plenty of oil. The question about the, the, the growing of the corn and the canola and all of that stuff is the, the, I guess my point is because we're using it as, a, as the oil as a second source, the restaurants have paid for the first price of growing and creating the oil. We're taking an off product from them. The other cool thing is we can take this off product back to the farmers and put it in the John Deere and run up and down the fields that way. So it really does kind of, it makes kind of a nifty closed loop. And since this has already been used once, and I understand the, the premise of the question, since this has been used once as a food source or part of the food industry, now that it has done that tour of duty, I don't feel too guilty about we're using this byproduct from their system. Yeah. If we were competing with, if we were trying to buy the, 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 virgin olive, the virgin olive oil and the canola oil from Noble Cisco and interrupting the supply of oil to the restaurants, we'd be in trouble. That wouldn't be a good thing. And then that leads into the next question is, at some commercial level, we're going to somewhere, sooner or later, max out what we can get from the restaurants. That's where the algae comes in. If it, you own, yeah, there, some of you own swimming pools. Some of you have children have fish tanks, that kind of stuff. That stuff grows like crazy, right? So that, we have now discovered that we can get oil out of algae. That's going to be at the commercial level end of the volume for the big scale stuff. All right. Partly, partly to answer your, your question is that, you know, there's a variety of sources that we need to get uh, our feedstock from. And there's not going to be enough waste oil in Santa Fe to, to fuel all of our vehicles. But, for example, there might be enough to fuel the school buses. So it could save them some money and we'd be using a waste product. So uh, we do have some students that are working on business plans right now, so I can't talk about the details of them that have been doing the calculations on the amount of uh, oil, waste vegetable oil that could, is likely available and that could be converted uh, into fuel. So, let's see what the next slides are here. Oh, that's a better one. Yeah, there's, there's a close-up of the thing from Roswell in action. We're actually processing, um, obviously, the professor. This is one of our students. This is the main processing tank, and we're actually priming the pump. This silver thing over here is our preheat system, so this is where the, the warm oil comes from. It comes down through this pipe. There's a little pump motor back over here that does all the maneuver, moving of fuel and oil and whatnot. It circulates up into the big tank. That's what. And then this was, this was a fun one in the middle of our wonderful every Sunday night, Monday morning snowstorms. <laughs> this is a young couple out of Canada. And they're on the quest to break the Guinness Book of World Records of the most miles driven without stopping at a petroleum station for diesel fuel. This is a diesel-powered Mitsubishi van that they live in. It's converted to run. It is converted to run on raw vegetable oil and or biodiesel. They got to the point where they needed to be able to be switching back and forth because in some places they could get restaurant oil very easily, but they could not get finished biodiesel fuel. So there's a big old tank. Oops, I'll go back. Up in that upper part of it. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I'll catch you. Oh, yeah. This is Chloe. She's standing in front of, this is our finished fuel. This is their pump. And then in the upper part of the picture, the, um, you can see part of the, there's an extra fuel tank in the back. So that we gave them 40 gallons of finished biodiesel and 40 gallons of vegetable oil and wiped the window off of snow and sent them on down the road. And we didn't hear from them until they got to LA. They drove straight from here to LA on what we gave them. So they're now, they're now circling around. They were, they were going to be in Vancouver for the Olympics, and they're going to drive through every state and every province in Canada, and they 
contact all the high schools and they do a similar program while they're out on the road talking on their tales and their adventures of running a vehicle on Bow Diesel and traveling all over the countryside. What's the official name of them, please, so we could look them up? It is. Oh, this is driven to sustain. Driven to sustain. Dot ca. Ca for Canada. Yeah. And the cool thing about their website, I don't know if they're on the road anymore or not. I haven't checked their website in a long time, but they have GPS software in their website, so you can see where they are. You can track their progress for so. So for several days, we thought they were hopelessly lost in LA because the, the little dots on the map are going. Just all over the place. Like, well, yeah, I understand that. If you've ever been to LA, the street systems down there, especially the highways, and all of a sudden they went north. <laughs> but it was fun to pull out their website and see on the GPS technology, you know, where they were going, what they were doing. They would send back emails of their adventures. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that uh, lower temperatures, or I think you the biodiesel crystallizes uh, or gels. Yes. Um, Mm -hmm. um, the, the first and the easiest thing is to just put a little bit of the petroleum diesel back in. Petroleum diesel is blended and will not gel at the same. This will go colder before it gets solid than biodiesel will. I guess I mean more to use more biodiesel rather than taking. You can put heating systems in your fuel tank and you can insulate the fuel lines. And of course most diesel vehicles, especially up here in the high desert where it gets colder, during the winter and at night, almost all of them come with a block heater. So you can, you know, just keep the vehicle. And now this is, really sounds strange. You can actually park the thing in the garage. I know, <laughs> I know most people can't because there's so much other stuff in the garage. But if you keep your car, your truck in the garage, it's a real happy camper because it'll get down to what, 40 or 50 degrees in the garage. And that's fine. It loves it like that. So there's, you know, put it in the garage or you can put a few more additive parts and pieces. Um, they've tried the, the um, anti-gel additives that are made specifically for biodiesel, for petroleum diesel in bio, and it just doesn't work that well. There's enough of a difference in the molecular structure that it doesn't work. Yes, ma'am. It's about 25 miles to the gallon that they're getting. Is that kind of standard? Maybe in the 2000. Um, well, considering the fact that the thing is shaped like a brick, so the aerodynamics are zero, it's packed to the gills with all of their equipment. So it's probably close to running this maximal gross vehicle weight rating um, and doing what they were doing. I, I was really happy to see 20. I bet if you ran that on a regular four-cylinder gas engine, it would be half that. As you can see, they're, they're set up, I mean, you know, spare tires and gas cans and oil cans on the roof. And then, you know, all the way up to the windows is stuff. It's full of, you know, there's, there's probably three millimeters of room in there that is not assigned to some specific task. Yes, sir. It is 40 degrees um, warm enough to run 100% bio, bio diesel? I think so. I haven't experimented. Yeah, but there, yeah, there you experiment with those things. Yeah, it seems to be a breaking point. Yes, ma'am. Are there any 18 wheeler um, studies going on with bio diesel pushing cargo across the country? Do you know? Absolutely. There are a lot of truck stops out there that are um, independently owned. A lot of the independent truckers will find bio diesel that's out there. And that brings up a really good point is that the EPA, and this is my soapbox and my rant for the night, the EPA in their infinite myopic wisdom took the sulfur out of petroleum diesel, which is a good thing for clean air standards. But the problem is sulfur was the main lubricant in the diesel fuel. And diesel fuel has to have lubricant in it when it goes through the injector pumps to make everything run and everything happy. So when the truckers found out about this, they'd stop at the truck stop, they'd stop at Loves or Giants and stuff like that, they'd fill up 500 gallons of this low sulfur diesel fuel, and they'd go down to Napa Auto Parts, and they'd have to buy 10 or 15 gallons of a, another additive to get the lubricity back. You can put as little as 5% biodiesel back into petroleum diesel, and your problem's solved. So you know, that's another selling point to the trucking industry, is that we've solved that issue. Well, and I think uh, one thing is uh, like the idea of adding petroleum fuel to the bodies was kind of unappealing, uh, unappealing for like because we're trying to get energy independent. But you can actually get um, trash and uh, stuff that has carbon in it and superheated and make uh, diesel like petroleum diesel that way. It's not petroleum diesel, but 
it's exactly the same as diesel. You can go ahead and mix that in with the biodiesel, um, and then you're not um, supporting other countries and you're keeping it local. Mm -hmm. And talk about move on to the uh, algae side. Okay, now we'll switch gears a little bit, and we've been, we've done our tour with uh, waste vegetable oil. And let's say all of a sudden there's a huge, huge da demand for biodiesel out there at the commercial level. Everybody wants it. The auto manufacturers have finally gotten the clue that yes, indeed, bio diesel engines in this country are an okay thing. We now have this huge demand for biodiesel. That's where the algae comes in because algae grows so quickly. And this, is, this was news to me almost a year ago. That inside each of those tiny little microscopic cells, there's a little drop of vegetable oil called lipids. And in this... Diagram here, and I'm way out of my league because I'm not a chemist. Is you have you have chemical processes going back and forth. You have, you have breathing and this good stuff. But in the middle of it, we create fuel. We create an energy. The nice thing about the the cool thing is that since it grows so fast, we've got ponds out there that we're growing algae in, aquarium tanks, so that we can grow enough algae. We can create a paste with the algae as we harvest it. And then the next technological advance that we're looking for is an easy way to get that oil out of the algae. There have been enough preliminary tests that everybody's really, really excited about the fact that the oil that's in the cells, I need yep. this wonderful picture here, is, is oil that is actually vegetable oil. So, it, you know, it starts out, you know, you're going to have to grow a lot of algae to fill a 20 gallon tank on a truck. <laughs> but since the stuff grows so fast, we can harvest it fast enough. You know, with regular plant crops, you've got one season. You grow canola oil, canola. We can grow that throughout the spring and the summer. We harvest it in the fall and we're done. This stuff we can harvest almost four times as fast. We can grow it in enclosed, controlled environments. We can control the light, the water temperature, and the nutrients that we feed it. So we can really hyper feed algae, and that becomes our next fuel source. We have to take it from the pace that algae is separate the algae cell, the plant material, and get the and get virgin oil out of it. And then we take that oil down this line and process it into fuel. One of the nice things that they were excited about algae in New Mexico is that you need sunlight. Photosynthesis, you need the sunlight to start the process. And you know, of all fifty states, New Mexico is number two in solar potential. So we've got the same potential for growing algae here. We've got lots of land. What we don't have a lot of is water. But the nice thing about algae is it can grow in wastewater. It can grow in briny, salty water. And we've got lots of salt water under the surface in large parts of the state. So we think there may be a real potential for this industry in New Mexico. So. And this is the algae lab. This is, this is a vertical ver uh, bioreactor. We have algae growing in there. Here's the all too well known five gallon aquarium tanks with growing algae in there. These are different strains of algae that we're seeing which one grows best under different nutrient conditions. This unit back here is a horizontal version of this guy where the algae will grow in these clear tubes in here and this is all a processing tank. This is part of what back, back at the Oshara Labs. This gentleman up here in this upper photograph is one of the technicians that helped design and build and engineer this system when we brought it out to California. Biosensory Energy is the name of the company that we're working with. So he's explaining all the nuances of how this machine works. This is another photograph from up above that you can see a better, better picture of. This is where your algae will grow. And this is like a gigantic radiator. You have pumps and motors down here. And the pumps will push the, the water and the algae growth through this radiator, through kind of a radiator system. This will be exposed to artificial light or sunlight, depending on where you want to set the thing up. The nice thing about this system is because these tubes are all flexible plastic. It's just basically gigantic baggies of some sort of, of type that this can be scaled up to whatever size piece of property you've got. We can put, you know, these are, these are like four footers here, but when you scale this thing up and you put it on a big piece of property, these things could be 150 feet long or bigger. And the tubes could be this is a scaled down version, the, the big version that we put in commercially are eight inch tubes. So you can see with an eight inch tube and 20 of those runs, 150 feet long, you've got a huge volume of water that you can run these things through and create massive amounts of algae. The nice thing about 
the enclosed algae systems is you don't have any outside pollution materials messing up the algae. And then once we grow, we have to identify what it is and what it does. So we have a microscope lab <coughs> that we pull our algae up and we take a look at what we've grown. And I don't mind that. I don't, I don't. Charles, do you know which version of the species this one is? Do you see it? It's a bunch of different kinds of... Okay, it's, it's a it's a popa remix. So we have so we have to you know, we have to figure out dry weight measurements of how well the algae has grown, how many algae cells we have per liter of fluid. So we have you know more lab equipment. Um, this is our star student doing more lab equipment work. That's his that's his winter haircut as opposed to today. Yeah, that's, 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 that helps us do more of the harvesting analysis of what we've actually grown. Um, cell count analysis, we have, we'll go back and this is, instead of just a regular microscope slide, this is set up on a grid. And these are one millimeter by one millimeter, tiny little things. And we can actually go back in there and do cell counts and actually get a reasonable <coughs> estimate of how well our, our algae has grown. These, different types of algae? Yes, we've got, well, we've got two favorites that we've, we've kind of whittled, whittled it down to, but there's hundreds of thousands of different types. But we've got two that we're working with in the classroom that seem to be, well, they're, they're from the industry, they're the best ones for the oil. They, have, they produce more, more of the oil. These are copies of students' lab, lab sheets, lab notebooks of how you document all your work. You know, it, 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 gets, it does get rather scientific and rather precise. This is one of our field trips down to the Department of Energy's Aquatic, aquatic Species Program down in Roswell. Um, this is a huge operation. How many millions of dollars? $20 million project when they put it together? Something like that. Great big, huge place. Um, all of this was set up by the DOE to study the viability of growing algae as that fuel source. So we took a tour of the place and when the money ran out, they just came in and told everybody to go home. It's just really spooky. You can walk in there and there, it looks like there was people in there yesterday, but they've been gone for 20 years. These are um, open pond, algae, open air algae ponds. This is a little paddle wheel that circulates the water round and round and round. So instead of being in the enclosed tube or the enclosed vertical reactor, um, there are people out there that um, are growing outside. And it seems to work. There's a couple of species out there that work, and like Randy had mentioned, that work off the salty brine water that we have a vast amount of down in that region. There's a species of algae that loves that salty briny water. The cool thing is that if anything flies into it from airborne contaminants, if it's not used to the high salinity of the water, it kills it. So it has its own built-in defense mechanism. So it, it will allow stuff to be an open pond system. There's a close-up of paddle. paddle wheels that have been sitting there for years. This was a part of our field trip. Um, this, this gentleman here, the John Wayne looking guy, this is Doug Lynn. He's real big on developing open water ponds and algae as that fuel source. So we went down and visited with him. These are his greenhouses for part of the research and development. These are some of the, this is one of the early, early, early ponds when they figured out that they, you know, Maybe this is the way to go is to get this stuff out into open air ponds. And the bigger commercial version of the, of the open air pond in the back, a rather nefarious looking group of people there. Um, and then this is their newest pond that they have not filled up yet. And it's got a liner in it. And this will be filled with the water. And, and it's, you can almost see the paddle wheel back here in that corner. And this is just a gigantic racetrack. And they just circulate the water and the algae. And they harvest every three or four days. It grows that fast. They can go in there and it'll take about 30% of the volume out, run it down to the processor, and put fresh water back in. And that's the class. So what we are working on at the school right now, um, our greenhouse arrives on Wednesday in a million pieces, so we get to put the thing together. It'll be fun. It'll be a cool greenhouse. 
um, installation and operation of algae culturing stations, we have to ramp up. We need to be able, we've done five gallon algae stations and we've done one liter jars and stuff like that. Now we're going to get into bigger volumes of production. Um, we are going to continue this biodiesel batch pro production. Um, as the word gets out, we have more and more people in town that have diesel powered vehicles and we have a number of folks that are asking, can we be a part of the program? Can we bring our truck or our Volkswagen by and test this whole thing out? So we are ramping that volume up. And then the fourth one, expansion of algae production. We just need to be able to make more of it because we need a lot of it to harvest and to work with. The, one of the, the interesting technological challenges we've had up until now is we can grow the algae. We can do that. We're getting pretty good at it. The school's getting better at growing volumes of it. The next big technological hurdle is how do we get that oil out of those tiny little cells economically and environmentally. Now, there have been a lot of, there have been a lot of ways you can do one or the other, but not necessarily both. So we're trying to get on both of them. Um, small scale cellular <coughs> production. Um, that's an interesting chapter in itself where there is technological advances out there at the enzymatic level where we can take grass clippings and wood chips, anything that's been grown, and put it in a process and it breaks it down into the starches and the sugars and we can create ethanol. So I go, hey, that's really cool because we can finally now have something of worth, and excuse me golfers, Coming from the golf course, grass clippings. <laughs> Installation and operation of bio digester and bio <coughs> production of heat. This is basically a compost pile on steroids. It's inside of a container with a lid on it. So it's under a little bit of pressure and a little bit of heat. But then again, we can create um, fuels. We can create methane, we can create fuels. We can run the engine on a methane gas also. So there's a bunch of different varieties of, when we say biofuels, we're talking about everything from biodiesel to compost piles. James, can either you or Xander talk at all about the technology that we're testing right now for extracting the uh, oil from algae? Oh yeah, I guess, yeah. Um, we got this piece of equipment in, uh, we got two pieces of equipment in, like kind of the same thing, um, but it's been different. One we got from a scientific company, the other one we got through an institute, uh, through a Texas school. And pretty much what we're doing is we're using sound um, to shatter the cell walls of the algae uh, to get the, uh, the oil out. Um, it's cost effective because we can use very low amounts of energy to create the frequency. And then um, what we do is we get an imbalance um, in the inside the cell wall. So once we hit a certain frequency, it just pops. Um, like by itself, and then the oil would flow to the top, and then the, the green stuff that's up over flows down to the bottom, and we can collect that and make ethanol from that. Um, so it's a way to get um, the oil separated from the other stuff so we can make fuel out of both. Yeah? Um, they're all a little bit different in, in, in their gel point when it's processed. Uh, canola works really well up here at these elevations. Um, soybean oil is not quite so not quite such a low temperature kind of a thing. James, what was the other guy down in Texas? Is that the guy? I know, well, then they're also using, I don't know who, who created the, um, who invented the one from Fisher, the, the scientific one. But like this, there's a whole bunch of different ones, but the one we're using from the school is developed by that guy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. First, I guess. Just, have you actually burned any? From um, no, not yet. no, no, not yet. I don't think we we haven't been able to get like a large amount of like of oil out of it because you need at least like a gallon, and then you can, and then you can start from there. There's another question. Yeah, getting back to the sound, um, how 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 much sound? How big of an issue is how much sound is um, created in order to start putting down the wall? Um. Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know how, how you measure sound. Really. It's, it's in me. But it's, it's like you can hear it. It's, it's not like so deafening. It's like you can hear the machine when it's on. It's like just like a really, it's a high pitched sound. Like it's 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 like it
Yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah. Like, yeah. If you have, a, if you have a, really, like, a lot of like, volume, you're going to need a lot louder sound, so if you travel through it, but if you have something like this, you can keep the sound low and just have the right frequency. Can you travel this again? Joe. Joe. James, Lo James Logan, right? Right. So we may have to talk about that one day. Yeah. Yeah. Do you use the uh, CO2 to extract the right? Um, I, 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 we've heard of that process, but I think we, we I don't know, I, I, I think we mentioned it in class, actually. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's not cost effective in the long run, um, is what I've heard. Um, but yeah, you can, you can do it that way. I'm not quite <coughs> sure how that yeah, it has to be under pressure. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, and, um, and that, that, that's why I don't think it's, it's energy. It's, it's cost. It's, I, I, I've heard of it, but I think I've heard that it's also not cost effective. But we, what we do in the class is when we do hear stuff, we, 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 try to, we try to come up with a way to, to, to experiment with it yeah. and to like, look further into it. This, this is a brand new program this year, so this is only the second semester. Andrew's in the first set of uh, 15 students that have gone through. So uh, they're getting to have a, a lot of fun because they're out actually getting to try all the new things. And even though we're a community college and we're training people primarily to be te technicians or in many cases starting businesses related to this, we're actually in involved in looking at developing some partnerships uh, with some universities and some private organizations to be part of research projects. So we're really excited about in these hands-on classes we're actually going to be doing uh, some real research. Did you know another experiment you wanted to show? Yeah, if we've got the time. Yeah, I'm going to run through some quick slides, and then James has got one more experiment. Uh, this is our new building I talked about that uh, is under construction. will be finished this fall. Uh, the whole building is a classroom, is part of the classroom experience, including the roof. So we have, on this side, we have concentrated solar. It's mirrored troughs, and we're going to be using that for the heating and the air conditioning for the building. So we heat and cool our buildings with hot and cold water pipes and we have coils and fans. We don't have radiant floor heat, but uh, we will be using this, and so 100% of the air conditioning and heating for this building will come from concentrated solar. We have storage tanks to store the hot water. Um, we have solar panels and solar film that go on the roof. We have a green roof. From this roof, we're actually gonna collect all the rainwater and snow melt, and we've got two large tanks on the second floor, and we're gonna be using rainwater to flush the toilets. We're not gonna use good potable drinking water uh, to flush toilets in this building. And everything's going to be exposed in the building so everybody will see uh, what it's like. Um, all our workshop areas, and this is actually our biofuels workshop, the second floor of the walls is a product called cow wall and let a lot of diffused light in. So we're going to have a lot of natural light in the buildings. We're also going to have passive solar. We have trom walls on the south facing walls as well as the uh, active solar. And then this is what it looks like when you take the roof off. These are classrooms. This is a visualization 3D computer lab. And then we have the six workshop areas. This one's biofuels. That one's our solar. And we're putting together some more trades programs uh, to be in this building. So we're really excited about uh, uh, this building and what it'll look like next year. So we can go to the lights and one more experiment. Stand up and crowd in here and take a look. This is a, a quick Come on up. to tell us what kind of condition our oil is in. We've gone to the restaurant, we pick this stuff up, and we fill it out the big pieces of tortilla beds and shrimp pens. <coughs> um, and the other cool thing about a lot of this biodiesel stuff is none of this is really, really high tech at this point. This is isopropyl <coughs> alcohol, and it's tinted with cooking spice called turmeric. You're all familiar with the cooking spice. That's what we use as our pH indicator in, in the balance. So I've taken 10 milliliters of powder <coughs> isopropyl alcohol. I'll put in one milliliter of our vegetable oil. Handy dandy multi-tool pair of pliers gizmo. What's that? Oh, I'm wired. Oh no. So we give that a good stir, and you can see the 
you can, call, you can all come up close and mix, mix the oil. You can see it's kind of gotten hazy, so you can see some of the oil mixture in, in there. Then what we take, this is distilled water with a small solution amount of our um, KOH, our pot potassium hydroxide, in a very dilute mixture in there. And what we do is we've, I'll draw up another syringe of this good stuff, and we start adding this. There's, there's a half a milliliter, and zap, it turns, turns red. That tells us that this is really, really super, super clean, good oil, and it will hold this wonderful color for 20 or 30 seconds. If you let it sit long enough, it'll actually revert back to the yellow. This tells us what our ratios are of our chemistry to be put into the raw vegetable oil to create the, the, the catalyst and the chemical reaction to create the fuel. But it's, it's, just, it's kind of fun. You go from that nifty gold color, and it just goes zap. And um, you, can, you can take this test kit on the road with you, and you can go to a restaurant, and you've just picked up a new client, but you're not sure how good the oil is. You can run this quick test. You know, one, two, and three, that's really, really good oil. If it's four, five, and six, there's two things. One, you probably don't want to eat there because they cooked their oil to death because it's going to take a truckload of chemistry to get it to convert into oil. So it's also, it's a food grade test from the back door. But I just, I just wanted to show, you know, this is, you know, just a, a nifty, quick, simple test to tell us what's, what the oil's doing. So if you go to Xander's parents' restaurant, you'll get the good test. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll be happy to know that most of the restaurants we're picking up from Santa Fe, because competition is so stiff, I've yet to see an oil from Santa Fe titrate higher than three. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I don't know about Taco Bell. Mm -hmm. It's up there. Wow. They just reuse it. Because I think McDonald's, after they're closed, they just like, put the oil in a thing and then reuse it the next day. So they use it again. And yeah. Again. So you get the good flavor. Yeah. They're into volume, not quality. If you go to La Fonda, you'll get quality. They change their oil out. I haven't been there recently. I think within uh, five days, every five days, they put a new batch of oil in there. And there's. Yeah, <laughs> this, this will change your dietary habits <laughs> after you find out how nasty their oil can get. <laughs>